Okay, quick disclaimer. What I'm about to say in this video isn't a criticism of these products as a whole, but the parts of them which I feel either worked or didn't work. It's also not a criticism of all Japanese media, hence the mostly in the title. It's an analysis of common tropes found within mediums such as video games and anime produced by Japan and how as a concept they're often misunderstood, misused or both. I also want to say that I genuinely like the things that I'll be speaking about. I've spent a bunch of time watching or playing them and would happily recommend them to anyone despite their flaws. I hate having to stress this stuff, but I understand that it's possible for people to feel attacked when something that you love is criticized. As I've said before though, criticism of something that you like isn't a personal attack. So please enjoy the video and if you have something to say afterwards then Feel free to leave a comment. I'm always happy to hear opposing viewpoints so long as they're not laced with anger. Much love, and as the Zoomers say, let's go. God, that made me feel old. Nihilism as a concept kind of gets a bad rap. Weird thing to say, I know, but it's true. People often see it as something that's inherently negative, and that's completely understandable. After all, it essentially claims that we are born into this world without meaning, and we're cursed to spend the rest of our lives searching for meaning. It also implies that institutions such as religion exist to give us false meaning, and as a means of controlling how we live our lives. This is all kind of true, or at least I believe it to be. Despite this, I'm still a happy person. No, no, seriously, I, I am happy. I, I, I know it doesn't look like it, but it's easy to confuse sadness with being British. When some people think of nihilists, they probably think of individuals with high levels of apathy towards pretty much everything, who avoid forming meaningful relationships with other people, behave in an unruly way, and are potentially self-destructive, lacking any concern for their own well-being or that of others. Although there are people like that out there, they fall more into the category of being doomers, something that I spoke about previously if you want to check that video out at some point. Philosophers over the years have had differing opinions on what nihilism means. These are all very base level interpretations, but Nietzsche, the original doomer, believed that life as a whole is meaningless, our values are meaningless, and our increasing adoption of nihilism will be the downfall of society. Jean-Paul Sartre was a little more optimistic. He believed that life is absurd, and that despite the fact that all humans are born without meaning, it's up to us to find our meaning. Albert Camus went a bit further and said that even though life has no meaning, you should ultimately be happy to be alive, and you should find your joy. Camus was, in my opinion, completely right. Being born without meaning doesn't mean that you don't have any incentive to be a good person or lead a happy life. Easier said than done, especially if you're in the wrong headspace or depending on your experiences with the world and other people, a person can fall into despair quite easily. I know I've had my fair share of experiences with hopelessness. I learned it takes effort to find what gives you meaning, but it's definitely worth it. Misanthropy, which if you're unaware means having a hatred of humankind, is also something that gets lumped in with nihilism. Once again, quite unfairly, but it's understandable given how nihilism is often perceived. Nihilistic characters aren't uncommon in the media, given a broad spectrum of what can define a nihilist. There are plenty present in the West, including Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty, The Joker, the narrator from Fight Club, Rust Cole from True Detective Season 1, Patrick Bateman from American Psycho, and many, many more. Some of these can also be defined as misanthropes, and although some nihilist characters in the West are antagonists, it's not always the case that their worldview is the driving force behind their villainy, with the exception of maybe the Joker. Usually this personality type is used to give characters outsider status, or perhaps illustrate that they see themselves above others, and it's often seen as a flaw, but that doesn't stop some audiences from seeing it as a reason to admire them, unfortunately. You may have also noticed that these characters tend to be identified as men, which isn't all too surprising, given how that tends to be the case in reality. 
Nihilistic, misanthropic characters in Western media generally have a decent level of complexity behind them. They are sometimes marred by past traumas or tragedy which has informed their bleak outlook. Some are intensely privileged and therefore place little value on anything, and some are a bit more of an enigma. Rarely are these feelings justifiable, but on a certain level they are understandable, whether that leads us to pity or loathe characters. Nihilism in Japanese media though, especially anime and video games, tends to be a bit more two-dimensional. In many cases, nihilistic characters are entirely defined by their worldview, and they generally have one of two personality types as a result, manic or depressive. Sometimes they may operate as an unassuming regular person hiding their true nature, but once their mask is removed, they either stoically monologue about how humanity is irredeemable and the lives of people have no value to them, or they're maniacally laughing while screaming and calling everyone pathetic, and usually they do that thing where they like cover their face with their claw hand while grinning and pupils become tiny. You know what I mean, like, you know. Ah. These characters also tend to adhere to certain types, too. They can be immensely powerful, capable, hyper-intelligent, over- or under-achieving, influential, privileged or underprivileged, and on numerous occasions they can be a combination of these things. But it's rare to find examples that don't fit neatly into these molds. Now, to be clear, this isn't me saying that all Western media is better than Eastern media. Both have their merits and flaws. So. Don't take this as a blanket statement, but I am looking at this through the lens of someone who consumes media from both sides of the world, and want to discuss the differences in representations and why they exist. I also want to look at and understand why Japanese media reuses these tropes frequently, and what their popularity and prominence say about Japan, since art can often be a reflection of the society that created it. Do they exist to make a statement on the state of Japanese culture with its loneliness epidemic, diminishing birth rates and increase in mental health issues? Is it due to a lack of inspiration? Is it because it's what audiences find appealing? And if so, what does that say about the audience? Either way, I think it's worth discussion, so if you'll indulge me for a moment, let's look at Japan's unusual relationship with nihilism. It's December and once again the holidays are here, where we reflect back on the year, overindulge and participate in mandatory fun. It's a time of year where you reunite with loved ones to create wonderful new memories and reminisce on the past. However, if your family is… normal, chances are the good times only last so long. Maybe your Uncle Jim starts complaining about wokeness, or your parents get into a fight because your dad thought an NFT would be a good present for your mum. It's not just a JPEG, Barbara, this could be our retirement. So instead of talking, you gather around the TV to watch your favourite movie, but oh no, turns out it's no longer available to stream in your country. You suggest watching The Boss Baby Christmas Bonus, but your family is not interested. They haven't seen the rest of the Boss Baby Extended Universe. Uncle Jim's now talking about how a woman at work tried to cancel him. Dad's claim in the NFT market will bounce back any day now. It's all falling apart. But it doesn't have to, thanks to this video sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN or virtual private network which provides you with protection while online and opens up parts of the internet for you that would otherwise be closed off depending on where you live in the world. It does this by routing your connection through one of its thousands of secure servers from across the globe, ensuring that your data remains encrypted and protected, whether you're browsing the web, downloading, uploading, playing a video game, or whatever it is you want to do online. What's especially great about Surfshark though is that it can unlock geo-restricted content on streaming sites, so if there's something that you want to watch that's not available in your country, chances are it'll be available somewhere else in the world. For example, if I wanted to watch the US version of The Office in the US, I'd have to subscribe to Peacock. But if I switch my country to the UK using Surfshark, I can watch all the episodes using my existing Netflix subscription. 
It works on pretty much any device that you have, including laptops, tablets, and smartphones, so it's perfect for using it with open public Wi-Fi, since it keeps people from potentially snooping on you. I've been using Surfshark for a good while now. It's fast, reliable, affordable, and I can't recommend it enough. If you are interested, Surfshark are doing a special offer this holiday season where if you use the promo code SOLARI, you can save a massive 85% off your subscription and you'll get an additional three months absolutely free, which is all in all a huge bargain. Surf is safe and open web today. As I mentioned in the intro, there is no shortage of representations of nihilism and nihilistic characters in Japanese media. It's an extremely common character type, and there are dozens, if not hundreds, of examples I can refer to. And if you consume this media yourself, then you probably already have plenty in mind. So if you do, I highly encourage you to bring them up in the comments and maybe explain why you think they were either handled well or poorly handled. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to be choosing six examples which are either fresh in my memory or have been stuck in my head for a number of years. Three of these will be something that I consider poorly handled representations of nihilism and or misanthropy, and the other three will be good ones, all of which are Japanese produced. I also won't be comparing them to Western media because, like I said, I don't want this to be an East versus West thing. For our bad representations, we'll be looking at Danganronpa, Trigger Happy Havoc, Final Fantasy XIV's Endwalker expansion, and Persona 4 and 5, which I know are technically two things, but I'm going to group them up for this case. Our good representations include Neon Genesis Evangelion, Cowboy Bebop, and Nier Automata. Unfortunately, this will involve some pretty substantial spoilers for each of these products. Personally, I don't believe it will hinder your enjoyment of them, but I know some people prefer to avoid spoilers like the plague, so each of these things will get its own chapter in case you want to skip some parts. So we'll jump right in and start out with Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc, which from here on out I'll just refer to as Danganronpa. By the way, here's your uh, spoiler warning right now. Uh, three, two, one. Originally released in 2010, Danganronpa is a visual novel by Spike Chunsoft, which sort of fits into the murder mystery genre. You play as Makoto Naegi, a student who won the lottery to attend Hope's Peak Academy, the prestigious high school in Japan. On his first day, he and a handful of other students are held prisoner by a psychotic animatronic bear called Monokuma, and they're told that they can either live there peacefully for the rest of their lives and never leave, or start killing each other. And if the murderer, or blackened as they call it, successfully survives the class trial in which you go over a variety of clues and evidence, they'll escape. But if not, and they're found guilty, they'll face execution. One of the game's core mysteries is who is the mastermind behind this well-orchestrated and carefully planned situation? Why were these students in particular chosen, and what did the mastermind hope to accomplish? Now, here's the big spoiler, so here's your last chance to bail if you want to. During the final trial, it's revealed that the ultimate fashionista, Junko Enoshima, is behind all of these events. She's part of the cast at the start of the game, but the students assume that she died after she was impaled by Monokuma, but it's later revealed that it was Junko's twin sister who was disguised as her to get close to the others, but Junko decided to kill her to show that she's serious. It's a weird game, okay. Lots of brainwashing, amnesia, uh, good games, but weird. Also, extremely problematic at times. Poor Chihiro. The students spend a substantial amount of time asking Junko how she managed to organize such an elaborate scenario, although they never ask how she actually got all the money to do all of this stuff. Pretty sure that being a teenage fashion model doesn't pay millions. Maybe the Toa group had some hand in it, but yeah, it's left annoyingly murky. More importantly, they try to understand why she did all this, and the explanation is pretty lackluster. It turns out that your girl Junko is actually the ultimate analyst, and her extremely high level of intelligence allows her to predict most outcomes, and as such, she becomes bored easily. She claims that she arranged what she calls the killing game because she wanted to make students feel intense despair since she sees that as less predictable and thus rejoices in the suffering of others, regardless of who they are. 
Junko is, by all accounts, a nihilist and misanthrope. She values nothing except suffering and disregards humans. She's arguably what people might think of when they hear the word nihilist, but in the context of Danganronpa, what we have is a character whose reasons for their villainy is fairly weak. Even when you dive into the lore of the series and explore her history, they don't really provide anything that would explain her ideology other than her high intellect bringing her to boredom. She's got some tragedy having been born into poverty, but it's not the driving force behind her misanthropy. I don't know if the creators intended to keep her background vague, but with the absence of a proper backstory or even an event in her life that drove her to this point, it paints a character that's just a villain for the sake of being a villain. Junko does what she does because it paints her as pure evil, and even though she's despicable, it's hard to understand her motives. Maybe if you're a teenager who thinks they're smarter than everyone else in their high school and no one gets them, then yeah, you might see some of yourself in Junko, but that's not a good thing. Well-written villains benefit from being sympathetic in some ways. They can be people who are well-intentioned but have questionable methods of achieving their goals, or they've been distorted by intense feelings brought on by struggle, like Scar from Full Metal Alchemist. Being so smart that you're easily bored isn't sympathetic nor does it automatically make you a nihilist, and even though Danganronpa takes place in a fairly fantastical world where something like that might be possible, I don't think it justifies or even explains her actions. Danganronpa and the games that follow it have the theme of hope versus despair. It actively campaigns against nihilism while trying to show how easy it is to give into despair, and even how you can find meaning in removing meaning from everything. You could argue that Junko represents that idea. She's supposed to be the embodiment of despair, but despair is a human concept, and if you put that concept into a character, then it's worthwhile giving that character even a shred of humanity, which Junko lacks entirely. It's unfortunate, because she and her ideology are the driving force behind the entire series. She has co-conspirators at times, but everything bad is done in her name, and Rather than creating a character that's compelling or charismatic enough to sway people's opinions, they just give her the power to brainwash people, which is a bit of a cop-out. Although if I had to hear her English dub in the anime once again, I would probably fall into despair myself. You like how they say sometimes some things are best left a mystery? Uh, yeah, don't watch Danganronpa 3. Uh, it's, it's not worth knowing all the stuff behind it. Next up, I want to discuss the most recent Final Fantasy XIV expansion, Endwalker. There's almost 10 years worth of story that lead up to the events of Endwalker, and not only would that take too long to recap, but in this instance, it's not entirely necessary to know everything. The main things you need to know, if you're unaware, is that in this story, the existence of all life across the universe is under threat of being destroyed at the hands of three antagonists. Fan Daniel, otherwise known as Hermes, a person from the ancient Asian civilization, Meteon, a mysterious being Hermes created, and Xenos, the leader of the vicious Galian Empire and sworn rival of the protagonist, or friend, according to him. In Endwalker, our antagonists attempt to inspire despair in every living being through conflict and horror. When beings submit to despair, they transform into monstrosities, which in turn can transform others who witness it, creating a vicious cycle of hopelessness. There are reasons behind these transformations that carry a lot of meaning, but I won't get into it here since it's long and somewhat complicated, so just roll with it if you're not aware. The antagonists Hermes and Meteon are the ones behind this phenomenon, and they devised it with the intention of spreading despair. The tertiary antagonist Xenos assisted in their endeavour with the goal of driving the Warrior of Light, i.e. your character, to feel as much hatred and anger towards him as possible in order to face him in combat fueled with those emotions, since Xenos lives only for the thrill of fighting a worthy foe. 
Xenos, by all accounts, is an extreme nihilist and misanthrope. He values nothing except battle and sees all human life as expendable, even at one point killing his own father. Despite this though, he's considered a beloved character among Final Fantasy fans. He's an unstoppable force whose actions are truly reprehensible, selfish and maniacal. He's driven solely by the desire to be equaled or bested in combat, no matter the cost. Final Fantasy XIV has no shortage of great villains, including Yotsuyu from Stormblood, Neathog from Heavensward, and Emmett Selk from Shadowbringers, who is arguably the best villain in the entire Final Fantasy franchise. These villains all crave destruction with the goal of some form of rebirth, or for the sake of revenge on those who wronged them or their loved ones, and they all stand out because of not only how well fleshed out they are, but because we understand their pain. Xenos, on the other hand, has no pain to speak of. He cares for only one thing, where never shown how he came to be the way he is and he just exists to give the audience something to hate and it's surprising that not only does such a one note character exist in this series with such well realized characters but he's admired and beloved by so many fans. I'm not passing judgement on you or anyone else for liking him, but he really is a trope. He even fits a few of the types that I mentioned near the start. He was born into immense privilege, he's capable, wealthy, influential and intelligent. He's arguably aspirational, which I believe to be some of the appeal in characters like Xenos, but I'll get into that closer to the end of the video. Hermes, on the other hand, is given some backstory to explain how he came to be. He was once a caring, compassionate person who valued all life and believed all things have a right to live, even if they didn't serve a purpose. Upon sending his creation Meteon to explore the universe and find out what other stars, which in this case mean planets, consider the meaning of life to be, she discovers that almost all life on these stars have been wiped out, whether due to conflicts or civilizations that grew apathetic after achieving endless peace, and concluded that their existence was no longer necessary. This revelation drove Meteon to madness, and ultimately despair. She is a being that communicates via emotion, and has internalized the suffering of the places that she visited. When Hermes learns of her discovery, he basically changes his entire view on life and creates a scenario in which all of creation will have to prove its will to survive in the face of catastrophe. Hermes' change happens at an unnaturally quick rate though. He's supposed to be this brilliant mind who greatly values life, possibly to a fault according to his peers. But the failures of other civilizations with differing values, dynamics, politics and so forth were somehow enough for him to abandon his values. And even Emmett Selk, a character who is written by the same writer, points out what Hermes is saying is sophistry. If we ourselves are flawed, it does not stand to reason that we too should be discarded. That is sophistry, and you know it! It's a limp and poorly earned transition into villainy, which unfortunately robs Hermes of sympathy, since he came to this conclusion so swiftly without any real rationalizing. When we see Hermes in present times, he has one of your typical nihilistic anime villain personalities. He's lived for thousands of years at this point and has had his views twisted further, which has somehow resulted in him becoming the manic personality type who likes to showboat whenever he can, speaks in a gleeful yet sinister tone and, of course, does the occasional evil laugh. Hermes did have his doubts on the nature of life and how the Asians see themselves as caretakers of the world, and you could say that all he needed was a nudge to change his beliefs, but I don't think that it was enough considering how much he cared about living things. It makes me wonder if the writers were trying to show how easy it is to fall into despair since that's pretty much the whole theme of Endwalker. The story is filled with heartwarming positivity and it can be genuinely touching, but Xenos and Hermes highlight a lack of understanding of what it means to be nihilistic. To its credit, Endwalker promotes the idea that humanity deserves to survive regardless of its faults, and those faults can become the catalyst for change. 
that we're capable of doing better and it's worth fighting against existential threats, even if it means failure. I'd go as far as to say that the story is a metaphor for climate change, especially since at one point there are plans to leave the star and colonize elsewhere, something which has in real life been proposed as a solution by certain idiot billionaires who want to be worshipped by humanity for saving them, even though it would be much safer and better to just use their wealth to save what we have. But no, occupy Mars. It's not gonna happen Elon, knock it off. Endwalker rightfully refuses this solution and asks that we value what we have. It's a beautiful message, but it's a shame that it's marred by the inclusion of characters who adhere to worn out tropes and only show the extremes of nihilism with flimsy justifications. Welcome aboard the Boost Bus. The segment in each video where I take a moment to ask you to offer your support to smaller content creators who could benefit from more recognition. This time I'd like to share with you the work of Birdie Blake, a freelance artist from Ontario, Canada. It's Ontario, right? Ontario. My wife tells me it's Ontario. Ontario. Birdie originally planned on becoming a concept artist in animation or video games, but their ambitions were unfortunately cut short after they received a lupus diagnosis on their first day of college, forcing them to drop out and support themselves via their art. Their work is heavily influenced by fantasy and horror characters, albeit with a more colourful flair than what you would expect from such a muted palette genre. Last year they began working on their comic The Magical Freelancers Guild, an urban fantasy based in the early 20th century about found family defying societal expectations while also falling into self-fulfilling prophecies and fighting against a Christo-fascist regime. Birdie also describes the cast as obnoxiously queer, so if that sounds like it's up your alley then check it out in the links below. Birdie is working on their comic and supporting themselves while living with a disability, so any support that you can offer them will go an incredibly long way, whether that's visiting their site, following their socials, or if you can, supporting them on Patreon. A little goes a very, very long way. They're also accepting commissions right now, so if you like some of their wonderful artwork, feel free to put in a request. If you're a small creator who would like a ride on the boost bus, then please send me one email to solarivideo at gmail.com. Please be sure to include a short bio about yourself, your work, and your influences, along with your pronouns, socials, sites, and anything else that's important. If you're an artist, then please be sure to include high quality samples of your work to be used in the video. I will be able to reply to all of your emails due to the volume, but rest assured, they are all being read. In the coming year, the Boost Bus will have two passengers per video to help clear up my backlog and give people more exposure, so look forward to that. Anyway, time to get back on my bullshit or whatever. For our last example, this is a bit of a two for one. Toru Adachi from Persona 4 and Goro Akechi from Persona 5, both of which are antagonists in their respective games. One of the driving forces behind the Persona series is the importance of human connection, and it delivers that through a leveling system in which you are rewarded for interacting with friends, which in turn offers major benefits in and outside of the game's combat system. It's so important that depending on how you play, over half of your playtime can be spent on these mechanics, and for some, myself included, it's the best part of the game, even though it does get horribly problematic at times. The characters you play as are largely blank slates, and it's up to you as the player to make an effort to build your relationships with others using your limited time. If you want to maximize these, then you pretty much have to follow a guide, which sort of goes against the idea of this being a role-playing game, but let's look past that for now. With this theme in mind, understandably, the antagonists are usually the antithesis of the protagonist. They reject human connection and in the pursuit of power, attempt to achieve self-sufficiency, and in the process abuse that power to achieve those goals, to the detriment of others, including innocents that stand in their way. Adachi and Akechi have histories which explain their disdain towards others and their nihilistic worldview. Adachi is your classic underachiever. He grew up with distant parents who expected him to excel academically. 
Persona games don't shy away from the issues with Japanese society and what Adachi experienced is unfortunately common. A lack of affection, validation and high expectations have led thousands of people in Japan to become modern day hermits, otherwise known as hikikomori, people who have distanced themselves from the rest of society in favour of isolationism in hopes of protecting themselves from being hurt by others. Akechi is a bit more extreme. He's the illegitimate child of Japan's most powerful man and his mother took her own life when he was a child, placing him in a foster care system. During that time he studied hard and eventually developed a talent for detective work, which gave him fame and the opportunity to cultivate a friendly, charismatic public image. This image would help him hide the fact that he was seething with anger towards his father and how he despises everyone around him. Because of these experiences, Adachi and Akechi both see relationships as potential weaknesses and sees those who rely on them as weak in turn. And as you'd expect, the game shows that this is a grave mistake and they're inevitably thwarted by the protagonist and their groups of friends. Real power of friendship kind of stuff. Super common in anime. You've seen it. Both Adachi and Akechi are once again extremes of nihilism and misanthropy. They were both gifted their power and used it for nefarious means and personal gain. While their backgrounds give them some level of sympathy, it's hard to accept the extremes that they go to in order to express their hatred towards humans, and those same extremes seem to exist purely to enhance our disgust towards them. You probably know someone like Adachi in real life, a guy that had a bunch of expectations on his shoulders throughout most of his life, couldn't live up to them, came back home from college to take on a job that they hate, struggled to find friends and became bitter towards everyone. They're the kind of people who've abandoned life because they feel like they've been abandoned by everyone else. There's something to be said about people like that. There are more ways of making the audience sympathetic towards them without turning them into typical, maniacal anime villains who revel in the role of antagonist. There's a broad spectrum of what a villain and what nihilism can be, and while some Japanese media successfully manages that, Persona and other products I mentioned don't balance that well enough. With Persona is particularly surprising for a series that does such a good job of humanizing its characters, it dehumanizes its antagonists by turning them into caricatures. There are some fans of the games who have a great deal of sympathy towards characters like Adachi and Akechi, and that's great for them if they feel that. But given their abhorrent actions, it makes it hard to see past the atrocities that these characters have committed. Adachi murdered innocent people in cold blood with extreme malice and no hesitation. Akechi killed potentially hundreds of innocent people to achieve his goals. Yet even the game expects us to excuse his actions because he's the victim of circumstance, ignoring the fact that he had a choice in killing these people. As I've said, Good villains are people who are ultimately sympathetic, but it's hard to feel for someone who's literally a mass murderer, and at no point does he express regret for what he's done. They don't even try to redeem him in Persona 5 Royal either. His mask is left off and he becomes an even bigger edgelord, but there's no remorse. He sorta has a redemption arc by helping the Phantom Thieves, but giving him a sort of chaotic, lawful flavour? I don't know, it's just unfiltered cringe in my opinion. Oh look at his f***ing Showtime attack, Jesus. Out of my Adachi and Akechi are both people who wear masks in front of others to hide their true nature, but upon removing it, they of course become yet another manic character trope. I don't know if this is intended to be comical or even self-deprecating, but it just comes across as embarrassing, or at worst, lazy. Persona games generally have a problem when it comes to sticking the landing with their characters, whether that's their plot or their representations, like Kanji and Naoto from Persona 4, but 
In the case of Adachi and Akechi, it paints people with pathos and turns them into 2D representatives of evil, who don't seem capable of being good or even wanting to do good. They're supposed to be people who represent what happens when you choose the wrong path when facing adversity, but for that to be meaningful, then we as the audience need to see the positive aspects of them. They kind of try to do it with their social quests, but by the time their true nature is revealed, it sort of negates all that stuff. The overarching problem with all of these examples and many others is that nihilism in Japanese media is represented as a binary. It's rarely seen as the spectrum that it is. It's just inherently bad and a gateway to evil. This becomes extra problematic when you consider that people actually admire these characters because they're nihilists. But that's not all too surprising when you consider that they're the ones who get to chew up the scenery every time that they're on screen, who have power and influence that they gained entirely by themselves. For a person who feels lonely and undervalued, who finds solace in watching anime and playing video games, when they feel as though regular life is just too difficult to cope with, it's easy to see why these kinds of characters are so appealing, even when the story has spent hours trying to prove them wrong. It becomes a power fantasy for those who feel despair, rather than a warning. They get to see someone they see themselves in succeed time and time again and become strong with little to no external help. In the end, the forces of good win because that's what they have to do, and the shades of grey between them and the antagonists are left unseen. I won't mention this character's name since we're out of spoiler territory now, but one of the characters I've mentioned brings up Hegelian dialectics at one point during the story. The idea that in order to advance, thesis and antithesis are required to find a synthesis in ideas. And it's kind of ironic that these products, and many others like them, never really try to achieve those goals. There's only the thesis, because the antithesis is never given anything of value, leaving us with the same stagnant stories and characters who ask for nothing except for our disgust, resulting in pedants like me banging on the fourth wall asking for more. Thankfully though, it's not all bad. There are some genuinely fantastic explorations of nihilism in Japanese media, possibly some of the best ever produced. For starters, there's Neon Genesis Evangelion by creator Hideaki Anno. Okay, so I'm sorry in advance that all the images that you're going to see here are stills, but just for some context, in my very early days of doing this, I actually made a video defending the last two episodes of Evangelion, and despite the extremely low view count and the fact that it was well within the realm of fair use, Studio Kara felt that it was necessary to give me my first copyright strike. So since this is you know, my job now. I don't really want to take any risks, so sorry about that. Evangelion is a pretty damn depressing show for many reasons, and that's largely due to our so-called protagonist, Shinji Akari. In the show, he experiences a variety of traumas, both emotional and physical. He has difficulty bonding with others, but desperately seeks validation, endangering himself to do so. When he's denied validation, he's at first incapable of finding any value in himself or life as a whole. At the climax of the show's original run, after giving up hope on being able to be accepted, he chooses a reality in which the borders between what defines us as individuals are broken down and humanity becomes a literal sea of consciousness. No more individual human beings, no more meaning. With this solution in mind, Evangelion posits that there is solace to be found in giving up and abandoning free will. It understands and explains the tremendous burden of simply being a human trying to exist among other humans, and how even though the boundaries that define us can be the greatest source of our pain, they are also worth having because it allows us not only to create our own definition and meaning, but you can possibly be loved because of them. It all leads to a wonderful conclusion at the end of the series where Shinji learns to self-actualize and is quite literally congratulated by the rest of the cast. And even though it's been mean to death, I still have to admit it tugs on my heartstrings every single time. Fans also haven't stopped mocking Shinji for his reluctance to accept responsibility for the fate of humankind with the whole get in the robot Shinji meme. I, I'm just saying, the kid's traumatized and 14. Like, 
Give him a break. Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop is someone who sees his life as lacking any value or meaning. He grew up alone, joined a criminal organization, and the only woman that he's ever loved died while trying to escape from them. The same woman who was coerced into killing him for her freedom. He goes out of his way to avoid forming attachments to others, telling himself that it's not worthwhile and doesn't place any value on his own life. He takes extreme risks which endanger his life without much thought. He chain smokes, he drinks, tries to push others away, and of course there's that infamous scene on Swordfish 2 where after being told that he and other people on his ship are going to die, Spike replies with, We can't live oh, well. without them. I knew I Whatever be happens, here, happens. Spike may have had his reasons for living taken away from him and even though he props up this image of a broken man who continues to live for no reason, as the series goes on, his actions imply that's not entirely true. He does form attachments with his crew and his life-risking behavior is often a result of him putting his life on the line for others that he allegedly doesn't care about. And on occasions, he's even charitable towards complete strangers in need. Spike is someone who is clearly carrying all of his pain and regrets with him, hence the famous line, you're gonna carry that weight. But he still manages to find meaning despite all this. He's an anti-hero and a tragic character, but everything he's been through very slowly makes him into a better person who finds value in others, even if he doesn't believe it. Lastly, there's Near Automata, where in the distant future, androids with consciousness created by the Yorha organization are in an endless war against the machines to protect the remains of humanity that no longer lives on the Earth. They were created for this very purpose, but eventually you learn that not only has the human race long died out, but Yorha created the androids with the intention of them always being on a losing end of this war. These lies gave the androids meaning. To them, the humans were God. The war always seemed winnable, but upon learning the truth, their purpose for existing was removed entirely. By all accounts, the androids are human beings. They're capable of retaining memories, developing feelings, and making decisions based on those. Despite this, they've been told throughout their entire existence to not acknowledge their emotions or question orders in the name of the greater good possibly denying themselves of happiness and freedom in the process. Near Automata is explicit with its stance on nihilism and philosophy as a whole, going as far as naming many of its characters after famous philosophers, including Jean-Paul Sartre and Blaise Pascal, who in turn mocks Nietzsche's fatalistic take on nihilism. It's a game that's emotionally devastating at times, refusing to shy away from the horrors of existence and what it means to have consciousness, and it's made all the more powerful by having you as a player participate in these events. Nier Automata asks you, what are you supposed to do when your life has no meaning? And the answer it eventually gives you is that meaning is no one singular thing. It's a collection of things that it's easy to forget we're attached to, even if it's something as simple as existing. And it expounds upon that by saying that we're supposed to create our own meaning. It also claims that even if meaning is prescribed to you by a third party, it holds nowhere near as much value as the things that you as a living being choose to find value in. You don't need gods or a great evil to destroy. You can just be and find purpose in your own time. The true ending of the game even presents you with the choice of giving the time you spent playing it meaning to you and someone out there in the world. When the final credits roll, you play a mini game in which you have to destroy the names of the creators of the game and eventually it becomes extremely difficult. Upon dying a handful of times, it asks you if you accept defeat, whether everything is pointless, whether you think games are silly and if there's any meaning to this world while messages from players across the globe appear on screen encouraging you to keep going. These completely random player names then join you as ships to help you finish your task, some sacrificing themselves in the process. As the entire development team of Platinum Games joins in on the song playing in the background, singing in unison for you. The game closes and you, the player, are asked to sacrifice all of your progress and game data to help someone else to give up all you've accomplished to be someone who helps another in a time of need when they need it to fight the credits. 
It stresses that you'll more than likely never know who you helped, and you may even dislike this person, but you will be helping, even if it's just for a moment. If you agree, it deletes everything before your eyes to add further weight to your decision. You have lost, but someone, somewhere in the world, has gained. Your time was given meaning, and that in turn has become someone else's meaning to continue through hardship. It's really hard to convey how hard this hits without having played the game, but it's a stunningly beautiful moment that's worth experiencing firsthand if you haven't already. And it props up Nier Automata's thesis that it's up to you to create meaning, to allow yourself to have meaning, even through sacrifice. Life and our existence as sentient beings may not carry any inherent meaning, but it doesn't matter because there are so many things which mean something to you and you might not even realize it. What these last three examples do right that the first three got wrong is that they want you, the audience, to pay attention to the grey areas. They don't present ideas of pure good and pure evil, and they don't attribute nihilism to either. Instead, it treats it as the complicated thing that it is. They may contain tragic backstories, traumas and painful truths, but they ask you how you can live with these things and still continue to exist. Japan as a country is in an extremely difficult place right now. A couple years ago, I made a documentary where I looked at the loneliness epidemic there and the kind of psychological toll that it's having on its citizens. Things have not changed since then. People aren't entering relationships. The excessive work culture is killing workers and they're being forced into insular lives. As I mentioned earlier, art holds up a mirror to society. And with this in mind, I don't think it's too surprising that many of the stories that come from Japan contain characters and themes revolving around despair and isolation. Many people there are deeply unhappy and unable to receive the support that they need. So they're choosing to give up on living and finding meaning like so many of these characters found in their media. The problem though is that according to the stories being told so frequently, the solution is to find friends and form unbreakable bonds with them, which simply isn't an option when you're working 80 hours a week or studying at school every day but Sunday. It's a nice message and these stories can indeed be inspiring, but I think it can also end up serving as a reminder for what people don't have and make them feel even worse. Life is difficult and confusing most of the time, and you have to figure it out while trying to prepare for an uncertain future. Nihilism isn't necessarily the end of all things. In fact, it can lead to beautiful new beginnings. We as humans are capable of finding meaning in the smallest of things, but it's also perfectly fine to detach yourself from meaning. I'm sure that plenty of you used to believe in some form of God and then maybe you just changed your mind as you got older. But you still kept living, even without the promise of a paradise in the afterlife. Maybe you even felt a bit of relief knowing that there isn't some giant guy with a beard watching you while you wank. Either way, you realize that you still had some reason to live. I just want to reiterate once again, I'm not saying anything I spoke about here is a bad product. I thoroughly enjoy all of these things. But in a world where mental illnesses like anxiety and depression are becoming all the more common and the stigma is being removed, I feel like it's best that we have more honest looks at what it means to feel despair and what kind of people experience it. And instead of portraying it as the catalyst for evil, it should be seen as something which leads to mistakes or even bad decisions. Human beings doing the things that humans do when they're lost and alone in the world who are hurt but end up hurting others and themselves in the process. Sympathetic people who don't exist for the audience to have a clear-cut answer for who the antagonist is. Because much like real life, you could be anyone's villain. You might not even know why, but you probably don't want that role because you're human and you don't want to be hated. So I don't think I'm being unfair when I say that we should at least try to treat those who are fictitious with similar respect. Thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, then you have excellent taste and you should celebrate that by clicking on the like button. 
If you disliked it though, that's fine. You can click on the dislike button. I won't stop you. We're all allowed to have disagreements. I'd also like to offer a thank you for all the wonderful patrons who support the channel, and I'd like to give a special shout out to the following. Mech, Ruby O'Connor, Fatey1703, Ellisren, Joseph Blair, Jonathan Morris, Donna Sato, Sean, Marcel Gibson, Rose A. Jane, Caro Schultz, Thomas Tomacano, Jen Valdeen, Mason, Bailey Graveling, Gerzon Bear, Tadeo Deoria, Ryan Osterman, Henry Longshot, King Me, Christian Moyer, Catherine Pendel, Azul Crescent, Alicia Crawford, Rachel J. Stark, Candide, Dan McCrary, Remy Allen, Daniel Perone, Lizzie Peasy, Grant B., J., Enrique Gutierrez, Murger Gur Fashionable, Alina, L.A.B., R. Atoms, Games, Shao Fei, Mickey Buonadonna, Sparrow Wagon, and lastly, Catherine. Thank you all so much. It really does mean a lot to have your support. And if you would like to join these wonderful people too, you can do so at patreon.com slash Solari uh, for all kind of benefits there, including early access to videos. Any amount goes a long, long way, so please consider helping out the channel. It's the end of the year already. How the hell did that happen? I've learned all kinds of stuff this year about YouTube, what goes up, what goes down, what makes people happy, and what makes people angry. I've also learned that even long-term patrons are capable of saying very cruel things when you say things that they don't agree with, but hey, such is life. But anyway, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season uh, celebrating whatever denomination you are or lack thereof. And in the meantime, enjoy this bonus footage of my cats, Kamu and Kiri, wearing these nice Hanukkah bandanas that my wife got them. Uh, take care of yourself, take care of each other, happy holidays, and I will see you in the new year. Bye-bye.